Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I am Julie Kohlauer. I'm with Kohlauer Plus Co. And I'm a contractor that supports the King County Link Up program. And we're very excited to be holding this carpet recycling webinar this morning and to have we had about 150 people actually register. So we know that there's a lot of interest in the subject matter, and we're really excited to share with you some great information today. Um, I'm going to sort of be the facilitator of the webinar today, and I'm going to kick us off with just a few webinar logistics. So to start off, everyone is in mute mode, and this is just so that we don't have any hold music or any kind of background noise disrupting the webinar today. If you're having technical difficulties, We'd like you to either um, text or call Wyatt, and I will give you his number. It's 206-251-9720. I'll say that again, 206-251-9720. Um, if that doesn't work, you can also just type something into your question mode in your webinar screen. Um, we are, and speaking of the question mode, we will have a Q&A section at the end of the webinar, and to manage that, we're asking people to type in their questions um, as we go today. So as the speaker is speaking, if you have a question, just go ahead and type it right in, and at the end, we're going to try to answer all those questions or have the speakers answer any questions that we get. Um, if we don't have time to address all the questions, we will follow those up with answers in a follow-up email that will come out after the webinar. So there will also be a section in the webinar where we ask for audience participation. Um, if anybody wants to give any updates, Chris Beatty will be doing this. Um, in this section, we ask you to raise your virtual hand, and we will unmute you when we get to that section. And then lastly, we will be um, recording the webinar today, and that will be posted on the LinkUp website. So if you want to share this with anybody else or go back and re-listen, you'll have the opportunity to do that. So I'll go ahead and kick ourselves off this morning um, to introduce our first speaker, which is Shirley Axelrod. Um, Shirley is a waste prevention and greed purchasing program manager for Seattle Public Utilities. Um, and in her job there, she co-coordinates efforts to increase carpet recycling locally, along with other business recycling projects. Um, so Shirley is going to start us off today by giving us an overview of the agenda and talking about why we are doing this webinar and giving us some context into this issue. So I'll go ahead and introduce Shirley. Thanks, Julie. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us today. First thing I wanted to do is show everyone our agenda and just go over what we plan to cover today. We'll have uh, updates from outside of the Northwest. Um, Kathy Freevert from Cal California Cal Recycle and I will uh, talk over um, things that are going out on in other areas of the state. Then we'll have Northwest updates. First from Terry Gillis for the Flooring Association Northwest and from Chris Beatty with King County Link Up and Sue Ellen Mealy from Zero Waste Washington. Um, and after that, as mentioned, we'll have uh, time for questions and answers, and then a wrap-up with some next steps back to Chris. So just a word about why we are doing this webinar now. Um, local solid waste agencies, like the one I work with, are interested in carpet because of the volume of it in the waste stream and the opportunities that it seems to present growing local recycling businesses as well as moving more material out of our garbage. Uh, a few years ago, especially, carpet recycling seemed like a very good um, opportunity. And here in the Northwest, especially where green building is very strong and recycling business is very strong. We've also um, seen carpet recycling increase here in this part of the country, although, as many of you know, there have been ups and downs as well. Um, we'd like to continue that growth. And we put a lot of value in sharing information among each other, uh, working collaboratively, and understanding who's affected and, and how they're affected and interested. 
So for people who aren't as familiar with carpet, just a moment about what's in carpet and why is there stuff that we are interested in recycling. Um, carpet consists mainly of a face fiber, which is usually one or two kinds of nylon, and now more commonly we're seeing polyester face fiber. Um, and then uh, carpet is made with material that's meant to, to stay together when it's walked on, when it's worn. So they're filler material and backing material that are tightly um, adhered together. Recycling means separating those things that were meant to stay together and trying to get good purity of the different materials when they're taken apart. Um, most of the recovered material now would be the face fiber that can go back into new carpet or it can go into uh, manufactured parts, mainly in the automotive industry. And then this slide gives you some examples of the kinds of products being made with recovered material from carpet, both the fiber material and some of the, the backing material, the um, backing and filler material. The filler is mainly limestone, so the products that uh, contain concrete are, are uh, an outlet for some of that filler material as well as, again, some of it goes back into the carpet industry. Okay. Thank you, Shirley. Um, so that gives you a little context to start us off today. Um, I'd like to now move us to the part of the agenda where we're going to talk about what's happening with carpet recycling outside And Kathy is the team lead for product stewardship at Cal Recycle, and she is overseeing the implementation of the California Carpet Stewardship Program. So to introduce Kathy here, we'll, we'll get her unmuted. And Kathy, are you there? I am here. And Great. Go ahead. And if I advance the slide, um, I will chime in here. OK. Um, first of all, I did want to um, thank you all for inviting me and to give this update on things happening in California. And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Bob Peoples, who is on the call and is the executive director of CARE. Um, CARE, along with Cal Recycle and many of our stakeholders, we've had a significant learning curve to climb to, to get to where we are today. Um, and in this presentation, if you can move it to the next slide, I'll be covering some of the program basics, um, a few of the results that we do have so far, noting that it is early in the, um, in the you know, development of the program, and then highlight some of the challenges we face. Next slide. Um, the Carpet Stewardship Program started with passage of AB 2398 in 2010. And it is important to note that there are three documents that govern the program. So if you're trying to understand it and learn more about it, these are the three documents to look at. The statute is where the legislature establishes the overall goals of the program, roles and responsibility, provides authority for enforcement and other activities. Um, the regulations are where state government develops um, regulations that add clarity to the statute. And then CARE develops the plan that it implements after state approval. And you can go to this web link here to um, download these documents if you're interested in looking at them. Next slide. Um, at the heart of the program is the stewardship organization CARE. And they are the only stewardship organization that was designated in statute. And they are the only one allowed until April 2015. And so they have developed and implemented a, and are implementing a plan. The statute does have in it a goal of continuous meaningful improvement of diversion from landfills and recycled output. And then the plan describes how that's going to be achieved. And more. it also provides more specifics on goals. And then they report to CalRecycle on the progress. 
So those are some key um, roles and responsibilities of care. Next slide. On the flows of funds, we often get comments about, well, how does the financing work? So we have this slide to walk you through that. On the left side, you can see that the carpet manufacturer adds an assessment to the retailer invoice. And um, five cents is charged throughout the chain. The customer does pay for it. So ultimately, this program is funded by the customer. On the right side, you can see that the carpet manufacturer pays CARE directly um, based on what they're selling into the state. And then CARE funds activities from its state approved plan. And in here, you'll see um, I've included some activities that appear in a plan update that we received just last week. Um, but so in it, you'll see things like incentives. And there's some new ones here for growth and non-materials. Um, a new one is a research grant. There's more on education and outreach. Uh, the state has oversight and enforcement activities, which it is paid for. There's a rural pilot and expansion. Uh, California is, uh, will have a program manager starting soon. And um, there's also other reuse, recycling, and diversion activities that can be paid for. Um, if they're identified in the plan that's approved. Next slide. So the government role, our, our role is to ensure fairness. And we do that by reviewing and approving the stewardship plans. We have a list of compliant manufacturers at our website. And it may be interesting to note that there is, it's a fairly stagnant list and does not change a great deal. Um, we then review annual reports and check on progress. And we have the ability to assess civil penalties to anyone in violation of provisions of the law. Next slide. And uh, for completeness, the retailer has a role to only sell product that is covered under an approved plan. Next slide. Um, this shows some key implementation dates. And in it, you'll see that the program started July 1st, 2011, that's when CARE started collecting the assessments. That's when it became visible on the consumer receipt. Um, also, I guess I should probably note that that five cents per square yard, it was initially designated in statute for the initial phase of the program. CARE can change that, but it has not chosen to do so. But it has that, uh, CARE does have that ability. And then if you jump down to the, towards the end of this list, you can see um, CARE resubmits the plan. And um, there has been, I think, fairly, you know, I think CARE has done a good job of tracking data. And they share that quarterly, which we post at our website. And um, 2013 did prove to be a challenging year for the program. There were two processors that shut down in California. And we had some unspent funds that were not being put to use. So it was apparent that some adjustments were needed. This did coincide with the, the planned scheduled update for May. So in May, we received a plan from CARE. And then we received a lot of feedback from our stakeholders. And um, so CARE was asked to submit a new version, which is the one that we received last week. And it is currently under review. So I can't comment on what I think about it, because I haven't finished reviewing it yet. Uh, next slide. Um, I have a few slides, four slides, that are from the last quarterly update from CARE. And they do contain quite a bit of information. So I'm only going to have time to highlight a few details, or I have a few highlights I'll, I'll pull out of them. So on this slide, you can see the recycled output. That's the bottom green line. And this is of um, you know, key importance for the program. You can see that it fluctuates from quarter to quarter and that there's a slight upward trend. Now, the top bar shows what's been recovered or collected. And you can see that that has decreased some. And that's, um, it, the gap between the two is a cost to the processors, because if you're collecting material and it doesn't, have, it doesn't become recycled output um, that you can sell, then you've got a cost for managing that. So I, I think that you know, ideally, these 
these lines would be quite close together and they would move upward together. So we're having some readjustment occurring in the program. Um, and part of this then is uh, we've got this issue of the non-nylon material that Shirley mentioned earlier. Um, there, there is a big concern about the non-nylon materials and I'm sure you'll be hearing more of that um, this morning. Um, it did contribute to the shutdown of processing facilities in California. So it's very important to find markets for the non-nylon materials because more carpet is made from it. Next slide. Um, this slide shows payments that CARE has made to processors. So the processors apply to CARE for recycling incentive payments, and the payments are based on what materials are sold into a new market. And CARE makes these payments each quarter. So at the top there, you can see um, amounts of payments that have been made. Next slide. Um, I have two comments on this slide. You can see the goals for 2012 at 12%, and then you can see that the program has been hovering around that goal. Um, also, you can see that most payments are for type 1 recycled output. This is of higher value to manufacturing a finished product than the type 2 recycled output. And an example then is type 1 would be engineered resin, and type 2 is a filler material. So, so this is good to see that most of it is going for the um, more highly valued recycled output. And um, the next slide, uh, admittedly, is a bit complex. Um, some takeaways are that CARE has the flexibility to develop and implement changes slides is for the growth of type 1 recycled output. And, um, you can see that $216,000 was paid for this in quarter two of 2013. And then there um, is also a new non-nylon incentive program that pays 12 cents per pound to end users who create a saleable product from the non-nylon material. And $179,000 was paid for this in quarter two 2013. Next slide. Um, this is the, the first time we're showing a slide like this where we've tried to normalize some of the data and put it in uh, percents or values per capita. Um, it also showing the, the uh, metrics in two, six months blocks of time. Um, this does view it out, I'm sorry, this view does smooth it out because um, you don't see it quite as much month to or quarter to quarter fluctuation. So a few things here. Um, you'll see recycled output, which is a key metric for the program, has uh, an upward trend even with some of the challenges the program has faced. And of course, we'll be looking to see how new incentives are playing into the program and, and how this um, trend line continues. Regarding collection, um, I noted earlier about how we have a, a slight a decrease in the um, pounds collected, and that's aligning the program better with what is the recycled output. Um, so it makes sense that uh, an effort is made to become a little bit more efficient. Regarding costs, um, sometimes people have a tendency to think, oh, all costs should be going down. Well, we have a situation where there was a buildup of unspent funds. And if you go to the bottom line, you can see a balance of funds for each time period. And at the beginning of the program, there was a reserve being built up. And there was concern that we, the program um, had a significant amount of unspent funds, and that was hindering the program's success. So CARE did respond. And you'll see then in this last six-month time period that it is lower. Um, that more funds are being spent on the program. So we acknowledge a reserve is important to have, but it's also critical to use the, the money um, that's intended for the program. And this is a, a key focus of the um, plan update that we're currently reviewing. So a, a few key challenges uh, is on the last slide. And um, 
We have found that it is challenging to come up with a method to measure progress. Um, we, you know, had a lot of discussion with CARE, and we did decide to use a sales-based calculation. Our waste characterization data comes out very irregularly. So although we believe that more carpet is being generated than what this formula shows, the formula is something that we can use year to year because it's, it's uh, available. Um, we agree that we'll monitor it and try to improve it over time. But at this point, we're not sure on how to reconcile the differences. Um, another thing to note then that our annual reports are going to be calendar from year on now. And and that will make it in sync with the accounting and quarterly payments. And then um, another comment is that by tracking the total recycled output and diversion, um, this will allow us to verify continuous meaningful improvement, which is a requirement of statute. Uh, another challenge area was um, making sure the program is statewide. And so uh, CARE did a pilot with four counties. And when CARE paid for the transportation from the transfer station or landfill to the processor, uh, we had pilots that worked. And so there are trailers on site. And instead of putting carpet in a landfill, it goes in a trailer. Um, there is still a cost for people that are dropping off carpet. But um, up to it's, it's determined by the county, but they can make that lower so that um, it becomes very you know, more appealing to put it in the trailer than to just dump it off and pay the tipping fee. Um, finding new markets for the non-nylon non carpet fibers, especially polyester, is an extremely important um, program challenge right now. Um, and there are concerns that if this isn't adequately addressed, it could undermine the carpet infrastructure, not only in California, but across the country. So um, CARE has responded with um, a research grant and incentives on this. And um, I think uh, it's a key area of focus now. Um, number four, um, new recycling programs have challenges with the ebbs and flows of, of the system. And this is not unique to carpet. I think any recycling program struggles with the supply and demand matching at each link in the chain. And um, when you have a flow of materials, anything that, that clogs up that flow is going to create a storage issue. So it's important to have the, the rec laws, requirements, ordinances, whatever it takes to make sure that these issues are addressed as they arise. So how long can carpet be stored? How much can be stored? How do you manage the risk from fires? What permits are needed? So these are things that should be um, dealt with as uh, programs are being implemented, ideally beforehand. And then um, the last item here is ensuring startup companies better understand CARES requirements, state laws, regulations, challenges to carpet recycling. There's more than one person will know. So it's not something you can go to one place and get all the expert advice. Um, when new equipment is purchased, you know, it may, there may be delays. There, it may not work as intended. So um, that's something that you, you gain by experience. Um, we all order. So a business plan has to be designed to uh, uh, be able to survive the quarters where there is less um, activity. And my own observation is that diversity in the business operations is a plus. So if there are multiple commodities to market, that can help a business ride out some of these fluctuations. So that is the end of this very brief overview of California's carpet recycling program, or carpet stewardship program. And I'll just end by saying we've, we've learned a lot. Um, CARE has responded to problems. And I expect new ones will arise. So having the flexibility to respond is important. And, um, and we look forward to continued improvement. Excellent. Thank you, Kathy, very much. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions for about anything that you're hearing this morning, just type them into your box on your webinar, and we will have a section at the end where we'll have the speakers um, address any questions that you have. So if you're thinking of something right now, go ahead and put it in there, um, and we'll get to it when we get to the end. 
So now we are um, going to have Shirley step back in and talk a little bit about what's happening in other, other um, states around the country outside of California. Thanks. So I will give you a rundown of uh, other jurisdictions that, uh, that we know of that have initiated carpet recycling efforts. Uh, a few different types. Um, California, you've just heard about. Washington, we will talk more about coming up. Um, these are some of the other um, areas that other jurisdictions will, will touch on. Several of these have legislative proposals um, in their uh, state general assemblies or state legislatures. Um, Minnesota expects to have, uh, in 2014, it's part of a governor's initiative, and there was something in 2013. New York has a bill that was introduced a while ago and is still, um, it still exists in their legislature and can come up again in 2014. Delaware adopted a study bill, a multi-year study bill that, um, expect to have reports on uh, in the upcoming year. Um, Illinois has a work group and part of that is considering legislation. British Columbia, which folks in the Pacific Northwest may know that British Columbia has a pretty strong product stewardship program that covers well over a dozen different kinds of project, products already. Um, and carpet is uh, slated to be um, covered by that um, in 2017, so three years from now. See, next one. Then a couple of other kinds of, of efforts that are uh, that are underway. Illinois has a working group that involves industry and recyclers and. NGOs, different parties there, and their subgroups look at different um, different kinds of complementary activities like developing drop-off locations and promoting carpet recycling, um, addressing issues that that occur, and and then as previously mentioned, in considering legislation which they are uh, recommending, um, and. North Carolina is an example of a state that has a business recycling um, development center, the recycling business assistance center, I mangled that name well, um, that works with the companies involved in carpet recycling. That makes a big difference, it, it appears, for the recyclers and processors um, and others in the value chain. The uh, manager of that agency is in sits in an advisory capacity to the care board. So different kinds of activities in different, in different parts of the continent. Excellent. Thank you, Shirley. Um, so now we've been talking sort of broadly about what's going on in other places of the country. We're now going to go to this section of the agenda where we hone in on what's happening here with carpet recycling in the Northwest. And so our first speaker for this section is Terry Gillis, um, who is the owner of Recovery One, who is a carpet recycler here in the Northwest. And he's also the chairperson of the Flooring Association Northwest Carpet Recycling Committee. So I will turn it over to Terry. Thank you. Uh, the retail and wholesale carpet community is anxious to participate in recycling programs. And most of our members understand that recycling does come at a cost. However, as long as that cost doesn't exceed the cost of waste disposal, they want to participate. Next slide. So Flooring Association Northwest is providing our members information to facilitate recycling, including classes on asbestos awareness, flyers discussing carpet recycling awareness, flyers detailing carpet removal best practices, assistance with reuse opportunities, and support for zero landfill events. It is safe to say that our members, who happen to represent the single largest group expected to fulfill the supply side of the recycling formula, 
are at the starting line with their engines running. So what is the holdup? Well, all recycling is dependent upon having a market for the materials that are expected to be recycled. And there is a very limited market for whole carpet. All the properties that enable carpet to survive for extended periods of time under some pretty harsh conditions make it difficult to break down into, a, into its component parts, which do have value in the marketplace. Today, carpet manufactured with nylon 6 and nylon 6-6 six, six space fibers and some carpet tiles have value which exceeds the cost of collection and or extraction. The challenge is to develop processing capabilities that allow for the extraction of all the materials used to manufacture most of the carpet. Two of our member companies are answering that challenge and have been investing a tremendous amount of time and money on new carpet recycling processes. They are, again, recy carpet recycling in Kent and Recovery One Inc. in Tacoma. These companies share the mutual goal of being able to accept and process a large portion of the waste carpet typically generated in the Northwest. Both companies believe the technology they are developing will enable them to achieve that goal. However, I can speak to Recovery One and say that we are at maximum capacity and will not be taking on additional customers until our new process through carpet processing and recycling is fully functional. Next slide. Flooring Association Northwest contact information is on, on the uh, uh, slide you have here. And the website has some great links to other carpet recycling information. Uh, I just wanted to throw in a quick note on carpet sizing. And that's that um, most carpet installers, when they go into a, a room to take the carpet, are already cutting it in half to facilitate removal. And I find this works quite well for us. Uh, when the carpet arrives at our facility, because we're going to bring it down to a six foot width or less. Length is not an issue. However, it is preferable that the carpet roll be left untied so that it can be quickly unrolled for testing and processing. Great. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, who is Chris Beatty. Um, Chris is the program manager for the King County Solid Waste Division's Link Up Program. She works on market and infrastructure development for a variety of recyclable materials, including she's worked on carpet or post-consumer carpet recycling since 2009. So I'll turn it over to Chris, who's going to talk a little bit more about what's going on in Washington. Thanks, Julie. All right, so um, we are fortunate to have carpet processing taking place in Washington. Um, we don't have any requirements happen here, but we have processing that has developed here, and that capacity has basically brought in the opportunity for building owners, carpet sellers, collection and hauling companies, and others to participate in the carpet recycling value chain here in the state. Um, so first I'm going to talk about, um, give some background on legislative activities that's happened in the state in recent years. Uh, carpet product stewardship bills were introduced in 2011 and 2012 in our legislative sessions. And um, these bills, had they um, passed, would have required carpet producers to fund and operate a system to recycle discarded carpet generated in the state. Now, um, these bills were distinctly different from California's AB 2398. Um, in that the California bill basically estab established an incentive-based program, as Kathy described, where payments are made to carpet processors and to manufacturers that use the secondary materials in new products. And the Washington bill called for producers, carpet producers, to pay for the full cost to recover and recycle carpet. And the um, funding mechanism was different in each of these, where AB 2398 specified um, an assessment on carpet sold, and the Washington bill um, didn't specify how the funding would take place, just that it would take place. Um, neither of these bills passed, and in fact, no um, bill related to carpet recycling was introduced in Washington in 2013. Next slide. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about demand for carpet recycling. Um, there are some private organizations and businesses that are asking for carpet recycling services, and here are some examples of the types of businesses who have contacted the 
public agencies asking for information and being connected up with those services. The kinds of things that are driving that interest are cost savings, the availability in the area, green certification, and maybe just more environmentally friendliness policies um, that the businesses are adopting. Um, increasingly, public agencies, like the ones listed here, are requiring carpet recycling for their jobs. Uh, and federal agencies actually must purchase carpet, being a product standard NSF ANSI 140, that takes into account the full life cycle of carpet products, including reclamation and end-of-life management. Um, among the several flooring contracts available to local and state agencies, um, Washington, um, in Washington, and the quasi-governmental groups also, are the Washington State uh, and U.S. Communities Flooring Contracts. Both contracts have very strong provisions requiring carpet reclamation, as well as provisions to prevent asbestos contamination, which is important. And they offer carpet products certified at the NSF ANSI 140 gold level. Great Floors is the vendor for the Washington State Flooring Contract, um, which is a pretty high volume contract. It's been in place um, since 2010. And the U.S. Communities Contract is held by Vendor Empire today. It's been in place since 2011, December 2011. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get you a little bit more information and follow up about um, the amount of carpet recycling that is happening um, through these contracts. Next slide, please. So uh, I spoke to several carpet sellers in Washington to sort of get an update. And uh, many of the carpet sellers that work within the service area that the carpet processing facilities um, service, they continue to recycle. Um, some of them have dedicated collection containers at their stores or their facilities in which they collect carpet from various jobs. And then um, hauling companies haul the container to a processing facility. And alternatively, others have their installers delivered directly to the processing facilities. I spoke with one um, company and was told that they much prefer working with the local carpet processing facilities over the services provided by carpet manufacturers at distant facilities outside of the state um, because the manufacturer programs have volume and packing and shipping requirements that can prove difficult to accommodate. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention here was, um, you know, carpet does not is not made with asbestos. Carpet has never been made with asbestos, but um, asbestos contamination from other other flooring, mastics, and other sources continues to be something that the sellers and their subcontractors need to watch for when they're removing carpet, whether it's for recycling or disposal. Next. Just a little bit about how um, discarded carpet moves around between the property that it comes out of and the processing facilities. Um, there are a number of collection and hauling companies that provide services to the carpet sellers or directly to construction project customers. And this is really, for Washington, this is primarily in the Puget Sound part of this. It really hasn't spread um, across, you know, across the state in a very even way, although it may be happening a little bit here and there. Um, in, in a recent conversation I had with one of these construction and demolition hauling companies, I was told that they are offering hauling for carpet recycling when the customer requests it. The company is interested in more business like this, but they would like to see continued attention on the is issue of asbestos contamination. And um, some carpet comes in mixed loads of building materials and it goes to a material recovery facility where it's separated and then sent to um, a processing facility. And I wanted to mention public transfer stations and what their role is in this. Right now, there isn't a public transfer station in the state that receives carpet for recycling, so that could change as new stations are built and with a greater focus on recycling. So we'll have to see how that pans out in the future. Next slide. Um, as Perry Gillis mentioned, there are two carpet processing companies here in Washington. Um, they are both located in the most populous part of the state, the Central Puget Sound region. And there's another facility that's in the planning in western Washington. Um, 
Again, and carpet processing and recycling are working hard to convert waste carpet into raw materials that have value and markets. Um, again, tells me that um, their markets for nylon currently are better than they were a year ago. That's good news. About a third of their output goes to U.S. markets, and so the rest goes to exports. Again, is disposing of their non-nylon, the non-nylon carpet that comes into their facility. So that's pretty significant issue. And carpet processing and recycling is um, developing its own method of carpet processing with hopes of high separation of constituent carpet materials. So it's exciting the work that that company is doing. Um, urban energy, I'm going to skip quickly over these last few bullets, but I wanted to mention urban energy is working on establishing a processing and manufacturing facility in Bellingham, Washington. They have a patent pending on equipment to make a fuel pellet for which carpet is the primary ingredient. Um, and they expect to source post-consumer carpet and maybe also carpet processing residual from Washington and Oregon. Um, there are a few other companies that have been involved in sourcing carpet for processing um, from the Northwest, including the manufacturers. Next slide, please. So markets for carpet-derived materials are, are limited in Washington. Um, but I wanted to tell you about this Washington-based company called Agressile Designs. They've developed this cement-based tile product that is made with the mineral portion of recycled carpet, which is the calcium carbonate. It looks like fine white sand and has some latex and carpet fibers in it that make it a good lightweight fill for these products. So these beautiful tiles, this is a, an installation in Seattle, it's a fountain. Um, these beautiful tiles are in low volume production right now in Washington and there's interest in, um, by a San Diego based company to produce them in higher volume. And then I wanted to mention Green Dot Concrete, which is it's another um, company that's trying the carpet sand and used in uh, utility type uses like hot tub pads and that sort of thing. So um, we have, do we have about 10 minutes? Uh, 15. Okay. Oh, wow. We're a little ahead of time. Yes. So um, we have 10 minutes or so to hear from businesses in Washington that would like to report on carpet recycling, maybe add to what I said or cover anything I missed. Anyone who has a comment or information they would like to share, should just click on their hand icon to raise their hand and we'll call on you. And perhaps there are other markets for carpet-derived materials in Washington that I didn't report on. Um, any hand? Jim Bernie. Jim Bernie. Great. Jim, you. We think we unmuted you. Can you speak now? I'm here now. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to report because we have the state of Washington flooring contract and we do quite a lot of reclamation of carpet through that contract. In our process, we gather the carpet that we have removed from the projects, the buildings that we're working in, we bring it to our facility here at Kent, Washington, and we store it here until we have enough product gathered to fill an entire trailer uh, that we partner up with different carpet mills manufacturers um, to send it back to the reclamation facility. So usually it um, takes, could take several months before an entire trailer is filled up. And then we work with uh, many different manufacturers that have their reclamation. Most of it is back in Georgia or, you know, back east and southeast. And uh, some, just uh, kind of some statistics for what we've done on the state contract. And the last year we averaged about Let's see, one trailer averaging about 14 tons of carpet went back there for reclamation, didn't go into any landfills. And usually it comes down to when we work at a manufacturer, uh, partnering up with them, it comes down to the price for transportation costs at the time we're ready to ship. Great. Thanks so much, Jim. Jim, do you want to tell everyone who you're with? I'm sorry. <laughs> great okay. floor. Commercial sales. Oh, it's great floor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh,
Krubia. All right, Stephen Krubia, can you are you unmuted now? Oh, Stephen, can you enter your audio pin into the phone, hit pound, and then we can unmute you? Yeah, we can come back to you when we do that. Does anyone else want to make a comment for this section? No. Bill Wood, um, we have unmuted you. Do you want to speak? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, Bill Wood, Empire Today. Um, we, uh, as you saw on your previous slide, Carpet Collectors was our primary vendor uh, down in California. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Um, obviously, the um, process is very important to us, and we do it uh, at most of our other facilities nationally. Uh, we're a little over two million pounds so far that we've recycled, uh, but we have a, a couple questions about why the process may be different here in Washington. First, we're we're having challenges because both the vendors that you have listed are not taking on new customers presently. Uh, we've been in touch with both of them, and we're trying to get uh, a regular process going. Uh, our regular process is the trailer on site. Uh, and it takes us about uh, about five six days to fill up a 53 foot trailer. Um, presently, we're fulfilling all of our contractual needs with uh, one off jobs to uh, one of the vendors. Uh, but why is it so expensive here in Washington compared to nationally? Uh, those 53 trailers, 53 foot trailers, cost us nationally about 300 to 400 dollars for pickup. And our pricing here in Washington State this has historically been over twelve hundred to sixteen hundred. Any any ideas about that? Um, yeah. I'm not. This is Shirley, Bill, and and uh, I'm not sure um, the answer. So that sounds like something that we will try and look into and 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 try and get an answer. Is that shipping prices that you're talking about, Bill, or 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 something else that's been paying um. Interesting. okay let us it's a good one for us to take away and and try to solve we can okay. include that in the follow-up email that we sent after the webinar thanks Bill. all right so Stephen we think we've unmuted you can you try speaking uh, can you hear me now yes we can great thank you Awesome. Sorry about that. The PIN number wasn't going through as I was trying to enter it. But my name is Stephen Krubia. I'm with uh, CDL Recycle here in Seattle. And I had the pleasure to talk with uh, most of you guys from SPU um, about this topic once before and since then. We, our opinion on, on this situation is that we do see carpet come through our facility. Our major problem is, with, as with any soft goods that come in mixed loads, is that contamination is the major problem. We would have to reevaluate each piece of carpet that came in on roll, check for contaminants, and then re-roll and store somewhere on site. So multiple factors in this are the quantity that we see of good carpet isn't as high as we'd expect to have a trailer on our already tight site. And then the process of evaluating it, re-rolling it, and hauling it, whether to again company or down to recovery one, were going to be two of our options. Um, we ran numbers and smaller loads to those companies, but they haven't, it just doesn't pan out for us here quite yet. So with flooring manufacturers being part of this, and pushing to get clean carpet from the actual carpet installers, I feel like that's a much better avenue to get more of the carpet out of the waste stream. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, it looks like we have one more person with their hand raised. Um, David Gagner, um, you should be unmuted. Do you want to try speaking?
David, are you there? Later. Yeah, maybe we can circle back to you, and David, in the Q&A section. Um, you can raise your hand again if you'd like to speak. Um, all right. I think we've gone to everyone who's, who had their hand raised. So um, keep the questions coming in the question section, so we'll address those with the various speakers when we get to the section. But thank you both to Chris and then also to everyone else who chimed in on that section with the updates. That was great. Um, so the next section of the agenda, um, Shirley is going to give an update on the progress of uh, carpet recycling in the Northwest, what we, what we know about what's going on. Shirley. Hi again, everyone. Um, I'm going to touch on uh, four different areas of things that are going on locally in, in Washington. Um, one is the uh, city of Seattle um, has adopted a landfill ban on, on carpet that will take effect in January of 2015. The second, we recently convened a market development advisory committee um, to look at, at uh, possibilities for the material recovered from carpet. I'll talk a little about that. Third, there's a new outreach project that we'd like to tell everyone about. And last, just a, a best practices guide for carpet removal that we'd like to re-remind re everyone about that's available. So next slide. Um, so first, the Seattle recycling requirements. People in this area probably know that Seattle has had bans um, affecting uh, what materials can go to landfill from Seattle businesses and residents for quite a few years. Um, we have quite a number of materials that are subject to bans, um, bans from being landfilled, and in just a couple of instances, bans from being used in certain situations. Um, uh, generally, the um, bans are, are the result of a lot of meetings and input from uh, industry and different parties and city council adopted a recent ordinance that adds five different materials to uh, the landfill bans that affect Seattle jobs that have building permits. Um, carpet is one of those five. The first of them start in, in uh, January 2014 and then others phase in, including the one on carpet, in January 2015. I think I'll go to the next. So this slide uh, gives you uh, uh, the, the pattern and the kinds of materials that, um, in, at least in the broad category of building materials, that are not allowed in the garbage in Seattle. So again, this applies to the the residents and, and businesses of the city of Seattle, um, and in the case of carpet and some of these other building materials, it applies to jobs that require a city of Seattle building permit. Carpet ban comes into effect January 2015. Um, we take into account what's going on with markets, and we need to be flexible uh, about this. We generally um, we don't bring the enforcement into play until the bans have been in effect at least for a full year. But, there, but this range of products, and I think our expectation is as markets develop and we work to develop them, um, more items get added to this list. Next one. So in that vein, in the last, uh, in the early part of, of 2013, so last winter and spring, we brought together an advisory committee to look particularly at the, the material that comes out of carpet and talk about potential um, uses, again, especially locally if we can work with local processors and manufacturers. And we had folks from companies that are, that are uh, molding plastic products, carpet processors, business, um, business development and entrepreneurs, um, folks from uh, universities, here in, in Washington that work with industry as well. Next one. 
And from the series of, of meetings and, and discussions that were held, uh, the main findings that I wanted to point out for people, we were looking for potential products and thought that uh, there was potential for products that could actually be used in recycling collection or recycling processing equipment, and that that might be a good, a good avenue for further work. Uh, for example, the plastic material could be used to make container lids or, or um, bin lids or for sorting equipment or for containers themselves that might be used in recycling processes. The aggregate, the calcium carbonate limestone that we've mentioned, we also looked at potential uses in, uh, in different kinds of, of infrastructure projects, so sidewalks or um, other building projects, um, again, that might work out locally. And we will continue to, to work on bringing together uh, people who don't necessarily always get in the room with their hands on the same material together, but who might be able to make uses of, of the recovered parts of carpet. Next one. And we're also um, launching a, an, effort, an effort that fits in the heading of working together to increase carpet recycling. Seattle and in King County joining with the new partner, Zero Waste Washington organization here in Washington. And I'm going to turn this over to Sue Ellen Neely, the program director for Zero Waste Washington, to tell you more about that. Thanks, Shirley. Um, as we've been hearing from all of the speakers on the webinar, um, quite a number of businesses and governments have been working together for a number of years to increase recycling in Washington. And this project that I'm about to describe to you aims at building on all of those past and existing efforts. We would like to expand and deepen the conversations that we've had with um, those who are interested in carpet recycling in order to learn more about what opportunities and barriers exist and to explore a range of ways to increase recycling in Washington. So um, why are we doing this now? Well, first of all, we do want to have conversations with some of the parties that we haven't met with before. And that includes groups such as property owners and managers, as well as retail stores that sell multiple products, but um, also offer carpet and installation. And of course, we also want to continue the conversations with some of the groups that we've um, connected with previously and engage more of those groups. And examples of those um, people range from design and build firms, carpet retailers, installers and removers, transporters, sorters, manufacturers, end users. It's really the entire carpet recycling chain um, that we want to um, be having contact with. So through this process, we're interested in exploring in depth what recycling systems and policy solution that works together to tackle barriers, consider a wide range of approaches, and eventually implement joint strategies. So what tangible actions are we talking about? Well, this webinar is one action, and there were um, widespread invitations to the webinar, and you'll be hearing later about how we'll be making the information more broadly available. And then a key next step will be meeting in person and having in-depth interviews with about 20 people who have different roles and interests in carpet recycling in Washington. Um, but we know that um, we want broader input than what the interviews are going to be giving us. So we'll also be sending out an online survey that we um, certainly hope that everyone who's on this call who's in Washington will participate in that survey. So that's what we're planning for the um, remainder of 2013. And then in 2014, we want to be developing specific next steps that are based on those interviews in the online survey. And we expect um, to be convening group meetings with diverse participants around the table in order to really dig deep in examining a broader range of policy options and other actions that we could be implementing to increase carpet recycling in Washington. So with that, I'm going to pass this back to Shirley. 
Thanks, Sue Ellen. In this slide uh, shows folks uh, a written guide that was put together here locally with many thanks to King County Linkup for the, the lead in bringing together a work group to, to SAM, Flooring Association Northwest, and um, local business businesses and carpet installers, uh, regulatory agencies who came together to put this guide together, and this is available to anybody um, to to uh, to download. Really looking to improve the or maintain the quality of the carpet um, that can enter the so it can enter the recycling stream effectively. I wanted to to kind of re um, remind people about about this and and. Uh, its availability, and again, with thanks to many many parties who helped put this together. Great, thank you, Shirley and Sue Ellen. Um, so now that brings us to our Q and A section of the webinar, and we've had a bunch of questions come in. So I think what I will do is read the questions. Um, if we need clarification, we might have to unmute somebody who's, who's submitted a question. So we'll see if we need to do that. Um, but I'll just and we'll have our speaker. Kathy, we're going to unmute you too so that you're available to chime in for the answers on these. Um, so I'll start one from um, Cameron, and I apologize if I don't pronounce people's names right, so I'll give that as a global apology here as we get into this. Um, this question is, how is the calcium carbonate extracted in the process? So maybe, Terry, is that one that you'd like to... Yeah, I can address that. Uh, the calcium carbonate, the way we do it is uh, grind it out. And there may be other ways of doing that, uh, shredding it out, but basically you want to grind it out and then get it to a point where you can separate it from the polypropylene. So grinding and screening. Excellent. Thank you, Terry. Um, now we have a question from Dave Gagner, and it is, how can carpet recycling be mandated if processes aren't in place to recycle the material? Shirley, you want to grab that one? Yeah, I, um, I think there are a couple of answers to that question. And, and the first one is you can't just mandate that something be recycled if there are no processes for it. So in reference to things like the ban in Seattle, we really are trying to keep tabs on the development with um, with markets and with capacity for material. The, the, um, the landfill ban in Seattle also, in our experience, these bans help to push the markets a bit. They help uh, processors and end users feel more certainty about the material coming in their direction. And that can be good and that can be bad, right? Um, but but uh, it's all kind of a, a dance of all the parts coming together. Um, we did originally think that the landfill ban would, would be made effective in 2014 and and have delayed it for a year to 2015 and and keep keep checking in with various parties to see um, the 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 reality out there with with markets and with capabilities. So that's all part of trying to to make these measures effective. Excellent. Thank you, Shirley. For Kathy, Kathy, are you able to be unmuted? Are you able to speak? I'm here. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll read this to you. Um, so with your stated focus to on the spend collected funds, describe any anxieties about spending too quickly or spending, in quotes, less intelligently. And this is from Dave Kipp. Um, well, certainly you don't want to just spend money for the sake of spending. But um, if you, on our May um, 2013 plan that was submitted, the program was on course to have in 2016 eight million in um, unspent funds, whereas the funds distributed were to be uh, about $3 million, a little over $3 million. So it was a reserve that was building up and building up. And, and then at the same time, there were some 
program elements that weren't working well. So then it's trying to figure out, well, you need to spend the money that's there. It's been collected. It's to spend on implementing the program. Um, and CARE does have a lot of internal analysis that they do. Um, and it'd probably be better for someone to, who's on the, from CARE to explain that. But, but just a, a quick overview, they have um, a committee then that is deeply involved in coming up with uh, the different scenarios and analyzing, you know, if we pay this, what, what might result. And because another concern is you don't want funds to draw down too quickly some reserve. So, um, so it is a bit of a balancing act, but it was just deemed that the program was on a course to have too much in the way of unspent funds. So Kathy, thank you. One more related question, I think, on the cost issue here from Philip Schmidt, I think it's Pathman. Um, and what he asks is, can you comment on the effect of low-cost landfilling on the program? Um, we are lobbying for a general increase in landfilling similar to that that has been established in many European countries to make the alternative to landfilling more competitive viable. Um, for example, um, resource cost slash resource depletion cost. Do you want to comment on that? Well, de uh, definitely if, if uh, landfilling is uh, more expensive, and we found that in the, in the rural pilots, um, the county that a county with a very high tipping fee um, found that um, providing a bit of an incentive where you participate in this program, you pay less to drop off your carpet. That uh, that county received a very good response. Um, and for in California, it does fluctuate quite a bit from uh, county to county, you know, as to what the fees are like. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, here's one from Troy Laudenbach, um, and he is asking, is there going to be a legislative action in Olympia again this year? Um, Chris, maybe do I give that one to you? Well, I mean, the answer, we don't have any idea what's going to happen at Olympia in 2014. We haven't heard anything about that. Um, and uh, Senator Jean Cole Wells, who was the uh, sponsor of the, the two bills in Washington, um, was going, and then she couldn't make it. So it's too bad that we couldn't ask her. But um, we, we don't know. I think we can say we don't really expect it. Um, but because I think maybe we would have heard something by now. But we don't know. And we, we can try to follow up on that as well. Excellent. Um, so Kathy, another one for you here. Um, please explain the comment about retailers to only sell product, and that's in quotation marks, um, in an approved plan. And this is from Jeff Callison. So this is in reference to um, the retailers are to only sell carpet that is covered under CARES program. So there's a list of manufacturers, and um, there's, what, 80 um, that pay roughly 80, sometimes 79, but roughly 80 manufacturers that pay into the CARE program. And so they are all listed. And um, then retailers are only to sell that carpet that's listed. So that is a program requirement. Um, it, it's to help create a level playing field because all those manufacturers are paying into the program, and we don't want to have free riders, um, you know, manufacturers that don't pay into the program, yet their product would be recycled and, and they potentially would be benefiting from the program. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so Bob Peoples had a question about the fuel pellets that were mentioned as an end market. Um, and wondering if these were Kila. Um, Chris, do you want to clarify? And no, no, I, I think I understand. Um, I was just told by the person sitting next to me that um, Kila is a company that makes a, a pellet or made a pellet. And this is not Kila. This is a, a different company. Um, and I don't know if, if 
there is any relationship between these companies, but I don't believe so. It's an, a new company coming in with a, a, a pellet that they have developed. Great. Um, next one is from Diana Wadley or Wadley. Um, what do carpet sellers think of taking carpet from non-customers? So, for example, some folks discard carpet but do not replace it. Um, they put in hardwood instead. Would those folks be able to send their material to carpet sellers somehow? Shirley, do you want to take that one? Great. Yeah. So from the, the times that we will call around and ask people who, who say they're recycling carpet, um, you know, to see what, what their activity is, and from the, um, the uh, times that we check in with, for example, the various carpet manufacturers who have services where they offer recycling, it doesn't have to be a situation where, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a situation where carpet's being replaced. It could be, indeed, that there's a demolition going on or carpet that's just coming out and something else is going in. I think the, the key thing that, uh, that will determine whether carpet can be recycled is the value of the, the material in it. So if it's not contaminated um, in a way that makes it not recyclable and, and contains, for instance, nylons, there are markets for nylon, not so good for other kinds of fiber, um, that sort of thing. So it doesn't necessarily mean that people have to be putting carpet back in. Thank you. Um, a couple questions here from Dave Gagner, and I think I'll break these into two pieces. It has to do with nylon and then um, non-nylon um, carpet materials. So let's start with the non-nylon. Um, is there a rough time estimate for being able to recycle other types of carpet than just nylon? Um, and then is, is anyone around the country currently able to recycle the non-nylon material? Terry, is this something you know anything about, would like to comment on? There are markets for non-nylon? Oh, there have been markets for non-nylon, and polypropylene was one of them used for making septic tanks. And uh, there are some opportunities in the non-woven industry to use just clean fiber of any type. They don't really have a particular desire for one type or another. I think LA Fibers is uh, pretty non-discriminant in what they put into their carpet pad uh, as far as fiber goes, but you've got to get it to them. And so, yes, there are opportunities for non-nylon materials. Here locally, uh, we're hopefully the process we're developing at CPNR will enable us to handle non-nylon materials profitably. And I believe, again, is also uh, pursuing that opportunity to try and, and be able to process non-nylon materials profitably. <laughs> at the end of the day, you've got to make a buck or it just isn't worth the time. So that's the key. And it sounds like maybe Bob Peoples has a comment on this. So, Bob, we're going to unmute you and would love to have you chime in. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. We got you. All right. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. And, uh, Terry, thanks for your overview on, on nylon. I think it was pretty comprehensive. I'd just like to add a few details. And that is that uh, CARE has hired an engineer to work on the non-nylon and, and focused a lot on the PET challenge nationally. He's been working at this for now about, uh, about three and a half months. Uh, we've got a matrix of about 30 potential um, technologies, market opportunities that we're working very hard on to try to find outlets for this material. I'm, I'm talking about major outlets. Uh, some folks that attended the CARE meeting probably know that there were a few announcements made for some very large uh, volume outlets, but they probably won't be online until 2015. The CARE board just approved a full-scale uh, trial in Europe that will take place in January to produce um, materials made from PET specifically designed to get the properties where they can be useful in a manufacturing process. And I'll just wrap, wrap up my comments by saying, appreciate Terry's comment about you got to make a buck. The economics of non-nylon, PET in particular, are extremely challenging. And people need to understand that before they make decisions on, on, on investments and such, because 
the availability of bottled chip and virgin on the on the global market is very low compared to the, the availability is high, the price is very low compared to high value nylons. Okay, great. And, and Bob, I'm going to leave you unmuted here for a second because you might want to chime in on this second of Dave's question, which was whether the demand for on 6.6 is being met both locally and nationally. Do you have a thought on that? Well, when, when you say demand, are you talking about I'm a recycler, I need it, and I'm getting all I can get versus I need it and I can't get it? Is that is that sort of the take here? I think so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, assuming that's the case, I think we do have some folks out there that could use more material if they could get their hands on it. So. Um, there are some challenges in certain areas around the country where if we could get some more nylon, it would be extremely important. I know in the, um, I know in the uh, Northeast, that's a factor right now, and I also know that, um, that there are folks in California that could, could process more material if they, if they could get their hands on it. Okay, great. Terry, do you want to add to that, or is that, are we good? No, very good. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay, so we've got another one here for Kathy, and this one is from Mike Hammond. Um, will the California bill be retroactive? If you have been shipping carpet into California since the law went into effect in 2011, will they go back and check shipping records and choose uh, the .05 retroactively? Or change the .05 retroactively? Um, I'm not sure about the retroactive part of that question. I think actually the word is charge. So I think they're wondering about, for the manufacturers, whether the, the charge will be retroactive based on shipping records or how that's going to work? Yeah, no, the, the, it goes from when the program started. Um, and so it, it's just carpet being sold in California. Um, there was some inventory at the time, and so that inventory um, because it would be sold after um, July 1st, 2011, you know, that, that uh, there was an assessment collected on that. I don't think I'm quite answering the question, but I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> Mike, if you have, um, if you want to state that a different way that might clear it up, feel free to type it into the question and we'll, we'll, we'll loop back with Kathy here. All right, we have another question from Dave Gagner, and it says, um, can there be a push to only manufacture recycled carpets? Recyclable carpets, I'm sorry. And Shirley, do you want to take that one? Yeah. So I think with um, some of what's been said here and certainly things being said in other conversations about how to deal with the different types of fiber or the different parts of carpet, um, I have to say there can indeed be a push. Um, a lot of different parties of us uh, can be part of that. I think um, maybe looking back at other recyclables that now perhaps look easy um, or relatively easy to recycle, uh, some, of, some of you, some of us will remember um, plastic bottles that had several different resins or uh, sleeves or labels that were a challenge and, and the movement over time to make them more out of a single material that makes it easier to, to process. Um, that kind of thinking can, can be found at least to some degree with carpet uh, as well and I think there, there's a good place for voices like these to to uh, to try and make that point that it's really the whole the whole life cycle of this product that uh, somewhere along the way consumers are paying the price of consumers ratepayers whatever are paying the price of so making them more recyclable from the from the beginning is a pretty important consideration and 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 sure I think part of working together. Uh, whether it's institutional purchasing or institutional or individual and and planning um, paying attention to that recyclability is a big is a big part not just what goes into it but what happens to it later on so thanks for that question 
Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like now to ask if there's a, a Francisco de la Cruz on the phone, and um, we'd love to ha unmute you and have you state your question if you could, because I'm not sure that um, I understand it. So can we find him? In, is he unmuted? Yep. Okay. Francisco, are you there? Yes. Can you okay, hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, why don't, yeah go ahead. Let's we're out here in a rural county that accounts for less than probably 5% of all total landfill uh, in Washington State, according to the Department of Ecology uh, reports. We're trying to establish a built green program, and we ran into the issue of, of um, transfer station tipping fees and how they play a role in local government's uh, uh, revenue projections, et cetera. Uh, our county happens to have probably the second highest tipping fees in the state. And it's not a financial inducement to divert or otherwise not get that revenue. At least that's what we're told by the managers of the transfer station. The Department of Ecology of Washington State is paying out in grant money to help reduce uh, the amount of uh, construction demolition debris going into transfer stations. But we're running into a, an essentially a brick wall. Do you see any other strategies to pursue when the tipping fee is such a high barrier? to local governments changing local ordinances and policies with respect to diversion and recycling. Okay, yeah. Thank you. That helps. Shirley's going to jump in on that one. Thanks. Yeah, let me see if, if, uh, if I can at least partly address what you've asked. Um, one of the things uh, about tipping fees is they vary quite a lot across the state of Washington and then across the country. Um, and in some places, people aren't paying tipping fees as part of property tax or some other way. So, so um, how people pay for um, disposal and then also how they pay for recycling, I think, becomes a place where there's, where there's room to, to send better signals. So in Seattle and King County, where the the tipping fees for garbage are second highest in the state, as you mentioned, Francisco. The, the tipping fees for recycling are considerably lower. And the more separated the material is when it goes to the recycling facilities, the lower that tipping fee. So, so for example, $140 a ton to get rid of carpet, let's say, as garbage in the city of Seattle or um, transfer station goes down to below $100 a ton if you're recycling carpet. So I think that's, I think that's a, a big part of how, uh, how the economic messages get, get sent. Um, and, and this is a good one I think we can maybe think some more about and perhaps provide additional information following up. Okay, great. I'm going to do one more question, and then we'll talk about next steps. There are a few questions that we haven't gotten to, so we will, again, follow up with those via email responses here um, in the next couple of weeks. But so the last question is from Bob Peoples, and he's asking about the role of public procurement, um, what it's going to play to help create outlets and demand. And maybe Shirley, you'd yeah. take that one. Yeah. I think... Uh, any of us who've looked at um, public agency and institutional purchasing feel like the, that's a, a place where we we um, we want to walk our talk and we want to use use our our purchasing power to to have an impact on the markets and and we we have in the state of Washington had provisions in the state contracts which got mentioned um, in Chris's talk. Uh, we've had provisions in those contracts for both purchasing recycled content carpet and recycling carpet that comes out of state institutions since about 2002. Um, we have provisions like that in the nationwide contract, the U.S. Communities contract, um, and the, the uh, kinds of standards like the NSF 140 standard for carpet that look across the life cycle, I think, also really help um, to, to tell that story in the marketplace and make it easier for purchasers. 
So I think public procurement is, is always a, a player. And besides public procurement, I think large institutional purchasing is also a significant player. So companies that own campuses of buildings and, and uh, are, are regularly buying flooring and replacing flooring, for instance. And so working together that way is certainly another way that, that we, um, we can uh, have an influence. And, and, and then part of that, of course, is not just what kind of flooring that we buy, but all sorts of other products that are made with recovered material that um, can be used in public projects and in private projects about those and helping to provide demonstration opportunities and so on, um, working with economic development folks to help local businesses that may be uh, developing products like that, um, using the academic institutions to help with and, and others to help with testing so that we can really characterize the material better for potential um, potential manufacturers and so on. I think all of those parts are part of what make a, a really well-rounded effort. No, no recycling program exists if there aren't markets for the stuff that's being, uh, that's being processed. It's just long-term storage otherwise. So. Great, thank you. All right, well, let's go ahead and close up today. And Chris is just going to talk about what's happening next. OK, great. Um, next slide, then. I'd like to announce that the 2014 CARE Annual Conference will be held in Seattle May 6th through 8th. And um, this is a terrific op opportunity for folks in the Northwest and around the country to get the latest information about carpet recycling and um, for us in the Pacific Northwest to share what's happening here. Um, the meeting is in planning, so look for program information and registration announcements coming out um, probably in the next month or so. Next slide. And um, to follow up on this webinar on the King County LinkUp website, we're going to post a recording of the webinar, a, a written update, um, on a lot of what we've covered today and maybe a little bit more, and um, written answers to the questions that we, um, that we uh, couldn't answer today. And um, we'll notify you by email once those items are available. To follow up on the carpet out recycling outreach work in Washington that Sue Ellen um, talked about, we will be sending Washington businesses and organizations primarily an email that includes a written introduction to the project and a link to the online survey that she talked about. So those in Washington, please look for that com uh, coming across, coming your way. And um, please participate. We're very interested in everything um, that you have to say. Your input is, is highly valued um, by all of us. All right, great. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of our webinar today. Again, I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, watch for the emails and the follow-up that Chris mentioned. And if you have any questions about this at any time, please feel free to contact either Chris or Shirley. Their contact information is up here on the screen, so you can take a moment to jot that down or you know, contact us and we'll get that to you. Um, but we definitely appreciate everyone taking the time to talk about this important subject this morning. Have a great day. Thank you.